Hello and welcome to this lecture in the introduction to banking. Um, we are now at chapter four, business models and income sources of banks. That is, we want to talk about how banks can generate profits, how they can, first of all, generate revenues um, and the different business models they might be pursuing uh, in uh, a typical banking sector. Um, we will talk about the basic business going on in commercial banking and then focus a little bit more about investment banking. Um, commercial banking is basically deposit taking and lending business. And you could also dub it traditional banking because it means um, you take in deposits um, from customers as your source of financing. And on the asset side, you give out loans to customers. Um, you transform maturities and because uh, most of the time you have higher risk in your assets, you have higher risk when you invest in loans, um, you have more long term investments on your asset side uh, than you have short term financing. And by transforming maturities and by transforming risk, you are able to well, um, get a return that is higher on your asset side than uh, the return you have to pay your financiers on your liability side of your balance sheet. And the result is that hopefully you make a profit. So this is rather traditional commercial banking and investment banking is a little bit more tricky because it encompasses a number of different um, businesses, uh, different uh, types of transactions, and uh, we'll later on see um, what investment banking uh, includes. So let's start with the uh, first section here on deposit taking. Very simple. Um, why do we need deposits in the first place? Well, um, because from economics, we know that people, households, many times would like to save. They want to save money and um, they want to keep money in an account with a bank and um, this is the starting point for deposit taking for the bank. So we have households who want to deposit, that's why we call it this way, in German Einlagen. Um, we have households who want to deposit money with a bank in a bank account, uh, could also be called a bank balance, bank deposits or simply just deposits and savings are the part of your available income as a household that is not used for immediate consumption. Um, there might be numerous reasons why you want to deposit cash and money in a bank account or why you want to save money. Could be that you are saving for future consumption, could be that you are saving uh, just to increase cash via an interest rate, via saving, uh, so to increase future consumption. And uh, these are just um, two simple reasons why households have a certain propensity to save uh, on their available income. Now, the savings rate is the percentage of the available income that is not used for consumption purposes. And in fact, empirically, we have a large variation when it comes to the savings rates uh, across countries and across time. Um, now, the gold sorry, the goal of the household then obviously is to um, smooth intertemporal consumption. Um, this is something that you will most definitely see in classes on microeconomics, um, where uh, we are interested in an intertemporal uh, consumption um, um, optimum. Um, and we are looking at intertemporal consumption. Um, in this lecture, we don't want to go into too much detail into the question why people save, why people um, save uh, some amount uh, of their cash. Um, we only want to say that, first of all, we have savings. Uh, people in households save money and bank can offer certain products uh, to enable those households to save on their available income. So this could also depend on the household's risk aversion. Sorry. Now, um, what is saving? Limitation of present consumption to increase future consumption. Why do people save it all? To secure the necessities of life in the future. Hopefully, uh, they save enough for future consumption. Um, it also has an economic meaning. This is what um, 
can be seen in microeconomics, the reasons why households save, but then obviously it also has a meaning in macroeconomics because saving creates capital uh, that can then be used to um, invest in the economy, in companies, in firms, and which then boosts production. So saving is an important instrument to prevent social, oh, there's a typo, decline, obviously, and welfare loss, but it's also an important instrument to booster um, macroeconomic production. Now, what is the savings rate of German households? It has uh, declined steadily over the years, as you can see, has gone from almost uh, 13% down to 9% uh, in the year 2000. Uh, after that, it has increased again. Uh, we then had uh, the financial crisis, so household saving went down again. Uh, probably because people were in need of money, um, because we had a uh, recession after the financial crisis, a uh, household needed uh, to um, take out uh, some of their savings uh, from bank accounts in order um, to um, in order to cope uh, with the um, effects of the financial crisis. Um, and then later on, um, let's say in 2013, it increased again, because at that point, um, the, um, the um, aftermath of the financial crisis uh, was uh, at an end and uh, the recession was at an end, uh, so people also had more money to save. So savings rates uh, change over time. Uh, this is the one for German households. Um, I've already given you a couple of reasons why um, we have time variation in household savings. Could also be um, that uh, savings rates change across countries. That is actually true. Uh, in this table, you can see the savings rates, the average savings rates in percent of the available income across several countries. And as you can see, it is highest and was highest uh, in France with uh, almost 16 to 17 percent. Um, second was Switzerland with 11 up to uh, almost 14 percent. Then Germany, UK, Canada and USA uh, having the lowest saving uh, savings rate. Um, does anyone have an idea why this might be uh, rather low for Canada and the USA in comparison to European countries? Some reasons. I think this is also on this slide. Yes. How can you? How would you try to explain those differences in the savings rates across those countries? Any ideas? No one you can write your answers in the chat window if you like. This is, of course, speculation, but you can. It's safe to assume that first of all, uh, Canada, USA, and also the UK have um, a much longer history of households investing in stock markets. Uh, so it could well be that. Uh, households in the UK, Canada and in the USA um, are much uh, more familiar with stock market investments and they are uh, much more leaning towards the stock markets when it, uh, when it uh, comes to uh, saving money. And it could be that some of their money is actually held in, uh, in stock markets uh, and mutual funds. Second explanation could be that uh, especially the United States have a long history of banks being rather unstable and bank defaults and bank failures taking place every now and then. They do have deposit insurance schemes nowadays, but uh, they also had a long history of rather famous banking crises in which uh, many people and many households lost their money with banks because the bank banks went bankrupt and they had no deposit insurance scheme in place. So all the deposits with the bank were lost in the bankruptcies. So there's a skepticism of US citizens and US households when it comes um, to the safety of uh, banks. And this is why it might be that um, the savings rates of those households is lower than, for example, in, in, in Europe. Okay. Now we have different types of bank deposits. Sometimes as maybe Americans are less risk averse and try to invest in stocks, for example. Yes. Different consumer behavior and different methods of financing the purchase. Yes. 
could also be the case. Um, um, credit cards um, have a much more higher importance and larger importance than uh, in Europe, for example. So this could also be an explanation why the United States have a much lower savings rate. But this is for, at least on my part, this is speculation. Uh, there are probably some, some uh, macroeconomists who have looked at this question in more detail. Um, but now let's turn to uh, bank deposits, uh, which type of bank deposits we have. First of all, we have so-called uh, demand deposits. Those are demand dep deposits that are um, held on current accounts uh, overnight, meaning that you can withdraw them at any point in time. We have uh, fixed term deposits. Those are deposits with a fixed duration. Uh, these are also called time deposit um, deposits or with um, specific notice periods. So, uh, these are called deposits at notice, meaning that uh, you don't um, you um, ha don't have a fixed uh, duration or maturity of say one year, um, but uh, you have a specific notice period. So you can have your deposits at any point in time, but you have to cancel your account, and then it takes say for example three months. So you have a three month period you have to wait until you can get your deposits and. Last but not least, we also have saving deposits. This is money with unlimited duration and notice periods at least three months and you get an issue of certificate uh, for this type of deposit. Now, why would a bank offer a different variety of bank deposits? One has to be, when, uh, actually I have to give you a disclaimer at this point. Uh, the problem here is Obviously, deposits used to be much more important for banks, especially in the European Union, in the Euro system, a couple of years or even decades ago. Uh, back in a time when we had interest rates um, and the level of interest rates at say three, four, five percent, um, obviously banks were um, in a strong competition for customer deposits. Deposits were one and actually the most important type of financing for banks and uh, banks competed for customer deposits. Nowadays, this is no longer uh, such a case because <laughs> you have access to central bank money and with interest rates being at zero percent, I guess people will leave some amount, small amount of money on their bank accounts, but they will not go to a bank in order to save money on their savings account. So this has changed to some extent. But now assume that it is still attractive for uh, banks to um, get financing via deposits. The question now is why should a bank offer a different uh, variety of bank deposits? Now, first of all, customers want a different variety. They want a variety of uh, products being offered to them uh, with different maturities, different risk. Usually they're all risk-free, but some have slight, a slight amount of risk uh, included. Uh, a range of interest rates, a range of availability and maturities. So the bank, as um, uh, one part of a banking sector uh, with a free competitive market, uh, competes with other banks um, in order to get bank customer deposits. So the bank, as such a participant in this free competition, it tries to meet this requirement of customers. So it will offer products um, that do not limit the scope of actions. Um, for example, there might be some regulatory measures, that's okay, but um, if, for example, you are interested um, or if your customers are interested in products with um, a short period of notice, a long period of notice, uh, a slightly higher interest rate, a slightly lower interest rate, then the bank will probably think about offering these products um, in their deposit business in order to rake in as many uh, deposits as cheap as possible. So there's a large interest, of course, in, in long-term deposits on the side of the bank. However, the customers will very much like to see uh, short-term deposits with a high interest rate. So in terms of the long-term deposits, obviously this would mean a low liquidity risk for the bank because you have long-term financing and you don't have the risk that uh, your financing breaks down uh, on a short notice. Okay. Um, what is, um, what can be said about the, um, 
the deposits as an investment opportunity. Now, um, the risk-free savings and deposits, they serve as external financing for the bank. It's basically a loan you as a customer are giving to your bank. Now, investments in the bank's equity serve as self-financing for the bank. And it might be that you also have hybrid securities that show features of external and self-financing, internal financing. Now, external financing is primarily based on deposits and bank loans from other banks or loans from central banks. We've seen the, um, the prototypical balance sheets of, say, Deutsche Bank, of Commerzbank, uh, and a large uh, savings and loan association uh, in the first lecture. And uh, from these balance sheets, you could already see that depending on what kind of bank you are, for example, Deutsche Bank, not so much, but um, the savings and loan bank, the Hamburger Sparkasse, definitely, they are strongly dependent on deposits as their main source of financing. So this is hugely important for banks um, for their external financing. Now, next, let's talk a little bit more in detail about the different types of deposits. Let's start with the demand deposits. Those are, as I said, overnight deposits of non-banks, customers, retail customers. Um, it's a credit balance in the check or business account. And the purpose for such a demand deposits is handling cashless payment transactions. So this is your account you're using, for example, to pay your bills. Also, you can use it as a disposition mass, that is as a buffer to cover unexpected payments in the short term, meaning that the bank extends a line of credit to you and you can use this line of credit uh, in order to uh, get a small short term loan, which probably you have to pay back uh, in rather short time uh, period of time. The interest payments uh, are usually low or non-existent. This is the price of permanent availability. And this was also the case even before interest rates dropped to zero level. Uh, so nowadays, I would guess you will get 0% interest. Um, and even if you leave um, your money on a different type of deposit, you will only get like 0.1%, 0.2%. So interest rates are extremely low. Interest rates, of course, vary, but interest rates adjustments are rare. So uh, you will see uh, differences in the uh, interest rates, but um, uh, this is rather rare. Um, then next, let's look at fixed term deposits. Those are deposits with a fixed duration, for example, a five year investment or a three year investment or with an agreement on a certain period of notice. So these are the deposits at notice. Usually, in many cases, the minimum investment amount is 5,000 euros or 2,000 euros, depends on the bank and depends on the particular pr uh, product, uh, is uh, catered to private customers and it's an alternative to savings deposits. So you can restructure your portfolio, um, invest a little bit more, you get a slightly higher interest rate, but you have to leave your money um, at the bank for a uh, longer period of time. Um, it is also available to corporate clients. Uh, those, again, are investment bearing investments. Uh, and the in interest rate obviously depends on the current market rate, duration and the amount of the deposit. So if you are leaving 5,000 in contrast to 50,000 euros, you'll probably get a slightly smaller um, interest rate. Um, those fixed term deposits um, are quite uh, frequently offered by banks and this is why uh, Deutsche Bundesbank has an official statistic on the effective interest rates and the overall total investment volumes for deposits of private households with agreed duration of up to two years and over two years. And you can see uh, between 2014 and 2015, uh, interest rate on average dropped from 0.8 to 0.65 percent for short term uh, fixed term deposits and they were almost 1.7% even back in 2015 for investments that had a higher duration. Okay, now how, how can you explain these uh, decreasing interest rates and the declining investment volume? Obviously, um, interest, rate, um, interest rate levels 
uh, went to zero or even became negative due to quantitative easing and the monetary policy of the European Central Bank and most other uh, national central banks. So monetary policy obviously is the main driver of uh, interest rates going down and now being close to zero. Okay. Now next, uh, we can also distinguish so-called money market papers. What are money market papers? Those are tradable on an exchange and uh, the most frequent ones um, in the United States are called certificates of deposits or just CDs. Uh, they are also called money market papers. Um, and what are certificates of deposits or money market papers? Does, does anyone know? Any idea? Well, actually, it's the same as a savings account or rather as a fixed term investment uh, and a fixed term deposit. The difference is that these certificates of deposits or money market papers, they are tradable on an exchange. So you get a marketable receipt for a deposit with one bank and this is a fixed term deposit and it now becomes tradable for institutional and retail investors. So it needs to have a standardized duration, a standardized volume um, and it offers a fixed return or it could also be a variable rate CD, a variable rate uh, or floating rate uh, certificate of deposit. Usually the duration is up to one year. So this is why it's called a money market instrument because up to one year is the money market, it's the Geldmarkt in German. And those commercial papers or treasury bills or certificates of deposits, the difference is that they are offered by banks, industrial companies or um, central banks. Uh, these are simple instruments, simple securities uh, that securitize um, a deposit um, for a fixed or variable uh, return. Uh, and the main centers of trade are, with well, no surprise, London and New York. This is an example of a certificate of deposit uh, offered by Reliance Bank, uh, which I guess is in St. Louis. And as you can see, uh, banks in the United States actually advertise these certificates of deposits. And as you can see, for a six, no, for a, in, 11 month or 25 month certificate of deposit, you would get 1.25% uh, annual percentage yield. Uh, and this is from 2017. So you can invest in a certificate of deposit in these uh, with these maturities. And you can then trade these uh, CDs uh, on the market. Okay. Now next, uh, let's turn to savings deposits. Again, also a classical money investment for private customers. Um, the savings book, which we know in Germany, the Sparbuch, is of course being replaced by rather an electronic savings card. And the withdrawal of money is now possible at ATMs, it used to be different. But up until 1993, uh, so-called Spareinlagen or savings deposits in Germany, uh, this was a legally protected term. So uh, only certain banks were allowed to use this name. And uh, this was in accordance with paragraph 21, section 4 of the Verordnung über die Rechnungslegung der Kreditinstitute, so the legal ordinance concerning the accounting of banks. Uh, these savings deposits are open-ended funds. They don't have a fixed maturity or fixed duration. They're an open-ended fund that fulfill the following conditions. They are marked as a savings deposit by drawing up a certificate or a savings book. So you need to have the savings book or uh, the certificate, otherwise it doesn't qualify as a savings deposit. They are not intended for payment transactions. That is why you cannot go into a shop and pay with your savings card or your savings book. They are not intended for corporations, cooperatives, economic associations, wirtschaftliche Vereine, partnerships or companies located abroad. And we do have some exceptions that apply to charitable, benevolent or ecclesiastical purposes, meaning uh, associations uh, that are charitable. Gemeinnützige Vereine und natürlich Kirchen um, sind hier ausgeschlossen. Die dürfen also auch Sparbücher haben. Okay. Savings deposit with a three month notice period 
are the standard in Germany. And we also know some incentives to sell those long-term savings deposits uh, with, via some special programs, for example, uh, growth saving or premium saving or target saving or extra saving or bonus saving, Wachstumssparen, Prämiensparen, Zielsparen, etc. Uh, those were and are programs, especially by savings and loan associations and credit unions to market uh, their savings books and giving customers a small, usually a rather small incentive uh, in the form of a slightly higher interest rate being paid on those deposits. If, for example, they kept their money uh, for a long time, if they increased their saving uh, from time to time, etc. So this is uh, so these were some incentives that uh, are and were used by banks to incentivize um, customers to leave their money on their savings accounts. OK, so we have savings uh, and of course we have checking uh, accounts. Um, so payment transactions take place via banks. And what types uh, of payment do we have? We have cash, we have book money, we have monetary surrogates and payment transactions take place directly between the involved parties through payment transaction companies like, for example, PayPal or through banks. Now, banks bear the risk of not being able to fulfill all payment wishes. Um, so they do face some risk that um, if the transaction goes uh, wrong, they are left uh, with some risk that they have to comply and fulfill this uh, payment wish. And those payment behaviors, um, the, the, the patterns in which households uh, pay, uh, make payments, uh, these patterns obviously have changed a lot with digitaliz digitalization and the use of electronic cards. So we have cash which is a legal tender. We have book money, money on your accounts, on demand deposits. Um, we have e-money, electronic money. I told you that this is used to be something different under German law because uh, this was a prepaid payment uh, unit on a chip card. This is actually pretty close to, um, I guess, uh, electronic wallets. Um, but this was around in Germany even 20 years ago. Uh, didn't um, really hit it off, wasn't really successful. And then, of course, we have money surrogates like uh, checks, bills of exchange, etc. Um, now, what are the differences? Uh, with cash-based payments, they imply an obligatory acceptance of the payee. If you have a euro note, um, everyone in Germany has to accept it. Now, cash is exposed to loss risk uh, due to theft, storage and security costs and zero interest. Book money is a claim against credit institutions with a right to cash at any time. Problem is that the bank risks a bank run. That is, the bank must immediately comply with the claim for payment if you go to your bank and demand repayment uh, of the money that is on your uh, bank account. Um, what else do we have? What types of um, payment transactions? Um, now, the expectations of the parties involved is that you have a fast, you have a secure and inexpensive payment transaction. And this is where um, most of the fintech companies and obviously uh, big tech companies, um, um, they are trying to um, uh, take some market shares away from traditional banks because they, uh, in some cases, uh, due to being um, able to use digitalization and modern technology, uh, they are faster. Uh, it might be that it's more secure, although I rather think that banks are quite secure at this end. Uh, and it could be less expensive. It could be uh, inexpensive in contrast to what banks charge. Um, so these are some expectations of the parties involved in payments transactions. Um, if um, you have, of course, direct transactions between the parties involved, um, this could be um, done, I guess, only between very large companies or between banks. Um, you have some transactions that include payment processing companies that will bundle individual cases and then process these bundles of payment transactions. And last but not least, um, you can have transactions via banks. Uh, someone asked if e-money can be like uh, the Bitcoin. Uh, yes and no. Again, uh, e-money, E-Geld in Germany uh, used to be 
um, money, euros that were saved uh, in electronic form on a card, on a chip card. Uh, and because it wasn't a bank card, uh, it was something different, it was meant um, to make payments easier uh, in shops because you didn't have to enter a PIN. Um, this, was, uh, um, this was something that had to be regulated uh, differently under German law and this is why we had e-money e and e-geld. This is it's similar to Bitcoin to some extent, but uh, Bitcoin is uh, much more complicated than that. So when we have direct transactions, um, now the criteria we've set up, secure, inexpensive and uh, fast. Those criteria are well met if all the involved parties are at the same place and amounts are small, for example, shopping in the supermarket. Um, so we have a direct transaction of cash, say, for example. This is, of course, the preferred option uh, when the sums of money are also related to criminal offenses, tax evasion, black market, drug trafficking, because there is no documentation required. And in illegal cases, this is what we call money laundering. So the attempt to channel money from illegal transactions into official payments. Um, we, since 1993 in Germany, we have a money laundering act, um, which states that every time you have a transaction uh, of um, more than 15,000 euros, um, it needs to be checked if there are any indications for criminal activities. This is actually done by the bank in the background. So every time, usually you buy, for example, a house or you buy a flat or you buy a car um, and you make a payment of more than 15,000 euros, this will, um, this will raise a red flag with the bank and the bank will start to investigate uh, and uh, open up some processes to check whether there is any indication for criminal activity. Hmm? Now, payment processing companies, they bundle payment transactions of many customers. They try to realize economies of scale and the transport costs for the means of payment, as they increase disproportionately with the number and volume for transactions, um, this is where processing companies uh, try to realize those economies of scale. Um, we also have physical protection costs for the means of payment. They also increase disproportionately with the number and volume of transactions. So this is one reason why you want to bundle um, those transactions. And then last but not least, uh, you can make your transactions via banks. Now in Germany, the first cashless payment transaction uh, took place in the 17th century uh, with Hamburg Girobank. Uh, was a payment via account transfers within this one bank. So you had one account with one customer and in the same bank, a second account with a different customer and they made a payment from one account to the other account. And this is the first example of a documented cashless payment transaction in Germany. And this is a gyro transfer. It's a transfer of payment from one bank account to another bank account that is instigated by the payer, not the payee. So you're not pulling the money, but you are uh, wiring the money from your account to someone else. We then had uh, a gyro system uh, through the Reichsbank in 1876, and we established a net of super regional transfers. And you, you have to think about this uh, as following. You had, let me just draw a little bit here. Yet one bank. And obviously, since the 17th century, you could transfer money from one account to another one. You have a different bank and you have a bank here and you have a bank here. Now, it doesn't make any sense to make a transfer from this bank to this one and from this one to this one, from this one to this one back and from this one to this one here and so on. What you would get is a huge number of payments of transactions each come with transaction costs and what is even worse is one part of the transactions cost you have is the possibility for errors it might be that every time you make a payment transaction here every time you make a payment uh, there is a slight chance of an error of, of wiring too much or too uh, little money so what rather you should do is instead of um, coming up with all these payment transactions, you will create a net 
in this system, for example, in Germany. And you will say that uh, some banks uh, are the center hubs of this grid. And you would say that each bank reports its payments, for example, at the end of a business day to this hub. And everything is netted with this hub. And then only the hubs will Oh, maybe can I use a oh, let's use a different color and only the hubs will then maybe during the night make those consolidated payments across this net and the first uh, such a net of super regional transfers was installed by the Reichsbank the German National Bank um, uh, during the Imperial Age and then in 1909 we had a similar system with the postal check within the postal system now nowadays we have the gyro gyronets uh, the gyro network of the deutsche bundesbank that is every german bank must maintain an account with the bundesbank it must comply with the minimum reserve requirements this is the statute of the european system of central banks article 19. now big banks they will operate their own networks and if customers of payers and recipients do not belong to the same gyro network, the payments must be processed via the Bundesbank network. Now, this is important because it is interesting to know that um, even 15, 20, 30 years ago, um, you had these systems, for example, in the, um, um, sorry, let me mute you. Um, we, have, um, we have these systems, of networks within the three pillars. For example, uh, the, a network within the savings and loan associations and within the credit unions. And we have uh, networks for payment transactions for each large bank. Now, go back 20, 30 years. It used to be the case that for each payment you did, it could be that, for example, if you were customer of a Sparkasse, um, a transfer to another Sparkasse uh, cost you zero euros. Now let me just pull this here. So actually it would cost you zero. Now if in contrast you were to make a payment to say a credit union, so a false bank, it could cost you maybe two euros per transaction per money wire and then to say deutsche bank it would cost you five euros actually not euros rather uh, deutsche mark um, because it was costly to transfer money from one net to another it was cheaper for the banks to um, process those payments within its own net from one bank to the same bank or from at least the Sparkassen network to the same Sparkassen network. Um, do you have an idea where you can still see the remnants of this, um, of this system? Any idea where you can still see uh, that people, it, it still lingers on for a very simple reason. Not because uh, those payments are so costly, uh, but for many companies and many uh, people, um, uh, they, they, they started doing this uh, actually 20, 30, 40 years ago. No idea? If you take um, any, um, any bill say from Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, uh, or any other company in Germany, is quite likely that you will see um, on the bill uh, the bank accounts of this company. And it used to be, and it's still the case, that for example, you have uh, IBAN.de, blah, 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 and you have a second bank account and maybe even a third bank account. Why? Because back in the days, back in at least in the 80s and 90s was still the case, uh, some time ago, um, companies 
and especially craftsmen and, uh, and um, uh, small businesses. They wanted to offer their customers the opportunity to make their payments to the bank they had an account with within one of these three pillars, within one of these systems. Because if, for example, I'm a private retail customer and I'm, I only have an account with a Sparkasse, but I need to make a, a payment to say, uh, my, uh, elect if I have to pay my electricity bill and the electricity company only has an account with a Volksbank, with a credit union, I would have to pay uh, a fee for that transfer. So as a service to customers, uh, most companies had one bank account with a Sparkasse, one bank account with a Volksbank, with a credit union, and one bank account with one of the large um, commercial, private commercial banks, usually Deutsche Bank or Commerzbank. And take a look at a random bill uh, you might have received in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you will see in the at the uh, bottom of the bill more than one bank account. And one reason is the companies want to give you the opportunity, the possibility to choose the bank of your liking as to minimize the fees you have to pay um, for your um, um, transfer and for your payment. So this is uh, one reason why um, people still today keep uh, a number of different bank accounts. Okay, so it has to be one um, via um, Bundesbank. Nowadays, obviously, uh, we have more sophisticated technology, we have ATM machines, we have document reading systems, even documentless data, medium exchange procedures, magnetic stripes, online, etc. Um, we've also had an automation in payment transactions, uh, this, the, the IDIFACT um, um, system worldwide and cross industry standard for the format of electronic payment in business transactions. Since 2014, in the Euro system, we have seen the single Euro payments area that included uh, the uh, big code and also the infamous uh, IBAN, IBAN number, uh, that is a huge long number uh, for your bank account that is standardized uh, within the European Union. Okay. Um, when it comes to cross-border payment transactions, we can see that actually banking and making payment transactions is not as simple when it uh, is cross-border and uh, outside of the European Union as we are used to it within the European Union. If you want to send money to say uh, China to um, not even North Korea, but uh, China uh, to uh, Afghanistan, India, it is uh, rather difficult and I had the misfortune of sending a colleague uh, a little bit of wiring a colleague a little bit of money to India uh, it is extremely difficult to wire money wire a regular bank in Germany to India uh, they don't even have the proper forms to fill in the Indian bank uh, information so um, it was a huge fuss and actually it cost, uh, um, um, I think, almost 20, 25 euros in fees. So this is extremely costly and extremely difficult as, uh, as soon as you move outside of the European Union. Okay. On the other hand, by the way, it's uh, rather convenient if you are the customer of an international, the multinational bank. Uh, this is for me, for example, was one reason uh, why I switched or I actually had a second bank account uh, when I studied in Japan uh, because there are some multinational banks, Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, Citibank, back in the day Targo Bank used to be Citibank in Germany. Um, there were some banks uh, which operated obviously in different countries and then you could simply go to that bank and withdraw money from an ATM machine from your German bank account even though you were in a different country. So very, uh, this is one nice feature of multinational banks. Okay, and some special features of traditional banks. I told you at the very start, they um, concentrate on deposit taking and uh, payment transactions. Uh, they have direct competition to providers who use invested money on the asset side. The traditional banks need uh, to increase fees uh, because uh, customers will 
uh, switch bank accounts and will switch banks uh, quite easily. And the advantage of traditional banks is that a transfer between a low interest payment transaction account and a higher interest deposit account with a bank is only marginally costly. So they can stay with the same bank and simply switch from one account to another. Uh, we also have some different types of payments, loyalty card, credit cards, debit cards, and money cards. But this is, I think, not uh, that important and not that interesting. Uh, I mean, the effects of using cards for payments should be clear to everyone, especially now during the pandemic. Um, we have reduced expenditures for banks. It has reduced the costs. However, the banks also lose information about the consumption and payment behavior of their customers to some extent, because now credit card companies are taking in this type of business um, and uh, taking in the information. You have competition by credit lines uh, of card issuers. You sometimes have intransparent pricing in the credit card business and the use of credit cards also alters the demand for money. So it also has an effect on central bank monetary policy uh, and it could also have a difference, make a difference when it comes to the purchasing behavior of those clients. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, Payment Services Directive 2, the PSD2 that took, uh, um, came into effect um, in uh, 2018. Now, the PSD2 uh, is a, a milestone actually in, in European banking because its goal was to increase competition between banks and non-banks, mostly fintech companies and tech companies, to strengthen the data security in online payment transactions and to harmonize the customer rights and responsibilities of payment services companies. And the main change was that banks after PSD2 uh, or since PSD2 are now obliged and are now forced to create an interface for customer data exchange with external payment service companies. For example, if you were to, um, to found a fintech company, and you have some comp uh, customers who keep maybe who download your app. And if you ask your customers, dear customer, do you want to grant me access to your data, say on this bank account you keep with Deutsche Bank? And if the customer says, yes, please do so, you can go to Deutsche Bank and say, the customer wants me to have his data or her data. And you can force Deutsche Bank uh, to make uh, an interface for you being able to download that data and to access the customer data that is kept by Deutsche Bank. This is important because this is now the, the access point for those small and also the large companies um, that are non-banks, but that are granted access by customers uh, to their data. And you can then found a fintech company and you can then go to the large banks and access the data of their customers if the customers have um, uh, given their, um, uh, their permission. Oh, so this is the PSD2. Okay, any questions concerning deposit business? Actually, rather simple and easy. Don't seem to be any questions, so let's continue with lending business. Very simple, um, banks give out loans. That should be clear. What is a loan? A loan is contract under uh, the law of obligations, uh, Schuldrecht, whose legal basis is laid down in the German Civil Code, uh, this Bürgerliche Gesetzbuch, BGB. Uh, and our German Civil Code, uh, it distinguishes two different types of loans. The first one, I have to give a disclaimer here. Many of these translations will be slightly awkward because it's it should be really done in German because this is German law, but still. Um, we have two different types of loans. The first one is money lending, Geldleihe, in which case the lender provides the borrower with an amount of money while the borrower is obliged to repay the amount of money plus interest at the agreed time or agreed times. The alternative is credit lending, which is Kreditleihe. In this case, the creditor promises creditors of the borrower to settle its debt in case the borrower cannot meet it. So the borrower pays a commission to the lender and it means that I, 
as a bank, if I give out this type of credit lending contract, I am promising others to pay the debt of this customer if he or she cannot pay it back. This is different because I'm not actually giving out money. I'm simply giving out the promise to pay money. Ja, also das ist der Unterschied zwischen Geldleihe und Kreditleihe. Geldleihe ist der klassische, klassische Kredit, der, Lo, ähm, der Loan, ähm, dass ich also einen Kredit vergebe. Äh, Kreditleihe, da vergebe ich eher das Versprechen, äh, dass ich hier einstehe, wenn jemand anderes seine Kredite nicht mehr bedienen kann. Okay. In order to get a loan, in order to obtain a loan, the customer first submits usually an informal application. And the bank then checks its ability uh, to enter a contract as well as the credit worthiness, the rating or scoring of the applicant and it proves or denies the credit application. If the customer confirms that he or she wants to make use of the credit, the contract is signed. Now in the credit application form, the later elements of the contract are recorded. So you will write down name, first name, surname, date of birth, etc. The contract then includes the personal data, the credit amount, the term, interest rate, uh, ancillary costs, for example, processing and management fees, uh, the modalities of provision and repayment, any loan collaterals, termination options, other conditions that are not specified in the general terms of uh, credit, allgemeine Kreditbedingungen, or special terms and conditions for the bank's lending business. So everything that is relevant to the loan should be laid out in the um, application and in the later in the contract. And we first have to see, do you, are you even able legally to enter a contract? Now, in order to enter a contract or be considered as credit worthy and thus to be able to legally effectively conclude a credit agreement, the customer must be legally and contractually capable. Now, first of all, persons under German law gain full legal rights at birth, but the ability to enter a contract as a rule begins at the age of 18. There are some ex uh, exceptions. For example, if the contract is only legally positive for you, meaning that, um, for example, um, you can you, you only um, you only profit from this contract for some reason. If there is no obligation for you, you can actually enter a contract even before that age. And the second important exception is uh, pocket money. Uh, if you are 12, if you're 14 and your parents give you some pocket money and you go to a local shop and buy some chocolate, obviously this contract is legally binding because it's just, it's just common sense. Yeah? So this is one exception we have here. Companies and corporations are legally and contractually capable if they are managed as a partnership or a legal entity under private or public law. So corporations obviously can also enter a contract. Now credit agreements can be terminated by repayment and of maturity or if you terminate. Uh, what will happen if you terminate uh, a credit agreement alone? What will happen? Any idea? Usually you can terminate, but you will be forced to pay the outstanding amount of interest rate, accumulated interest rates that you would have paid until maturity. So if you sign a loan contract, uh, a loan agreement, you will have to pay up. You will have to pay all the interest rates you have agreed to if there isn't something extraordinary happening. Now, for loans with an agreed term, the regular right of termination of the borrower is regulated in the German Civil Code. For both parties, the general terms of credit and the Civil Code provide for an extraordinary right of termination. For example, if the borrower has made false statements or his or her financial situation or credit worthiness or collateral has deteriorated. Uh, meaning that if you lose your collateral, If you have lied in your credit application, then obviously the bank uh, in this case has an extraordinary right uh, to terminate the contract. The borrowers may also terminate mortgages if a loan property 
is to be used for other purposes, but they must pay the lender an early repayment fee. That is what I meant, that they have to pay the outstanding interest rates. So this is, you don't get a break on that. Now, um, this is a general contract. It's a credit agreement, it's a loan contract, and you can then distinguish different types of credit collaterals and different types of loans. Uh, so let's first go through the different types of collaterals. We distinguish between personal and physical collaterals. So we have personal collaterals, a guarantee or a surety, a guarantee, the co-assumption of debt and the letter of comfort. And as physical collateral, we have an assignment for security, the transfer for security, a right of lien and a right over real property. So what are these? The first one, a guarantee or surety in German Bürgschaft is the case that a third party commits to pay debt of the debtor if necessary. We have two different types, the ordinary regular surety or a directly enforceable guarantee. This is Selbstschuldnerische Bürgschaft. And what is the difference? With the Gewöhnliche Bürgschaft, with the regular surety, the guarantor only has to pay if the creditor has unsuccessfully sought foreclosure of the principal debtor's assets, meaning that you have to step back. You have to step back as the guarantor, or you can step back, and you only have to pay up in case the, the person you are guaranteeing for cannot pay his or her bills. In that case, you are liable and you have to pay up. Now with the Selbstschuldnerische Bürgschaft, the guarantee that is directly enforceable, which is actually what it is, it means that the bank can involve the guarantor directly in the repayment of liabilities and it doesn't have to go uh, to uh, the borrower in the first place. So you have to pay up immediately if the bank wishes to. Then we have the guarantee, the guarantee. In this case, the guarantor commits himself or herself to guarantee a certain success, repayment and interest calculation of the loan amount. Now, the guarantee, the guarantee is not regulated by law in contrast to the Bürgschaft, the regular surety. So it's not uh, in, in written law. Um, it does not expire upon repayment of the underlying loan and it may also be used as collateral for further liabilities of the borrower. Next, we have the Schuldmitübernahme in German, the co-assumption of debt. It means that a third party agrees to be liable in addition to the debtor for the same liability. This is regulated in paragraph 421 of our German Civil Code. And last but not least, when it comes to the personal securities and personal collaterals, we have the letter of comfort, the Patronatserklärung. In this case, the parent company of a group agrees to always provide financial support for its subsidiaries so that it can always fulfill its credit obligations. This is in the case of a usually a large company where you have a parent company and its subsidiaries and it um, it guarantees that it will pay the obligations of its subsidiaries. Okay, then the collateral securities, the physical ones. Uh, we have um, the Assignment of security, actually, yes, um, we are here now. We have the physical securities. First of all, the assignment of security, die Sicherungsabtretung. This is a claim or another right of the creditor that is transferred to a third party. So you are saying, okay, I, am, I have a claim against uh, one of my customers, but I'm giving this, I'm transferring this claim to the bank so in case I cannot pay my loan, you have a claim against my customer. And you can then distinguish between the assignment of claims for security, for example, from sales, from assets deposited with credit institutions and the assignment of rights for security, for example, of corporate rights or of mortgages. For banks, those assignments of claims for security are especially important. And these are concluded between the creditor of the receivable to be assigned, who is also the borrower, and the bank, who is called the session sessionary, whereby a distinction is made between the silent assignment and an open assignment. What is the difference? Um, 
in the undisclosed assignment, in the silent, in the stillen Abtretung, the debtor of the assigned claims is not notified about the change of creditor and therefore continues payments to the assigner who then forwards the payment to the assignee. Very simple. Um, I have sold some products to customer. No, I've sold some products to buyer. Or let's make it even. I've sold. I have sold some parts to Daimler Benz. Um, and I'm in need of a loan. I go to a bank and I say, hey, bank, uh, I can give you as a collateral my claims against Daimler Benz. You can you can um, try to get the money from Daimler Benz and I can then in a silent or undisclosed assignment, I can then sign over these claims to the bank. And in this variant, in the undisclosed assignment, Daimler-Benz is not notified of this. Daimler-Benz pays the money back to me and I have to transfer it to the bank. Now, in the uh, opposite case, obviously, uh, Daimler-Benz is notified and Daimler-Benz then pays back to the bank directly. That is the difference. So in a disclosed assignment, the debtor is notified about the change and settles the claim directly with the assignee. That is the case in this constellation that Daimler then and the bank um, interact. In an assignment of trade receivables, claims can be transferred individually or continuously with a framework contract up to a given amount. Now, the overall assignment of claims, if you sign over more than just one claim, they can be made in the form of uh, an overall assignment that is called in German a Mantelzession or a blanket assignment, which is a global session. What is which is which? Now, in the overall assignment, the borrower transfers the existing claims against certain debtors to the bank and replaces expired claims continuously with new ones by handing over a list of debtors. In the blanket assignment, the claims are determined at a flat rate in the contract of assignment, for example, all claims against the customer with initials A to H. The important difference here is that in the, uh, in the latter one here, uh, you don't really know which one. Um, and how many these are, you only know that as soon as you have one claim coming in uh, with initial A to H, it is immediately signed over. In the second, uh, in the first case, it's signed over only as soon as we hand over the list of debtors. Let me say this in German again. Das ist der Unterschied zwischen der Mantel und der Globalsession. Es geht ja um die Frage, wann geht die Forderung, die Sie dort abtreten, rechtlich über. In der ersten Variante, in dem Moment, wenn Sie die Liste übergeben, im zweiten Fall, also hier bei der ähm, Globalsession, da ist es eben so, dass die Forderung bereits dann abgetreten ist, wenn sie entstanden ist, weil Sie haben ja den Vertrag bestehen, dass alle, zum Beispiel, alle Forderungen gegen Kunden mit den Initialen A bis H, dass die abgetreten werden sollen. Und dann ist klar, in dem Moment, wo eine neue Forderung reinkommt bei Ihnen ins Unternehmen, wo Sie ähm, so eine wo es zum Beispiel über die Initialen klar ist, dass sie abgetreten werden soll, dann ist sie bereits übertragen. Okay, so this is the difference between overall and a blanket assignment. Um, it may also assert rights of lien on its own claims against the borrower, which take priority of, over the assignments for security. And this is why a disclosed assignment is typically used for such for such assignments for security. Now, in the transfer for security, Sicherheitsabtretung, the ownership of a movable asset of the debtor is transferred to secure and to collateralize claims of the creditor. The asset remains with the seller who is allowed to continue using it. For example, if you uh, transfer for security a truck to a bank, and you can then continue using that truck because you need it to, to um, generate revenues. Um, but um, this is legally um, then the case that the bank owns the truck. Okay, next we have the right of lien. This is the encumbrance of an asset or a right to secure a claim. The bank may utilize the impounded object for the settlement of its claim from interest payments and the right of lien on a claim comes about by drawing up a contract between the two parties. The debtor of the claim has to be notified 
which is why the assignment for security is preferred in practice. However, if the borrower has deposits placed with a lending institution, the assignment will not be eligible since the bank would be creditor through the assignment as well as debtors through its own bank deposit contracts. Last but not least, the right of lien on a security is established by agreement and by handing over the security. Um, and with the right of lien on a movable object like jewelry or precious metals, the pledge is also handed over to the bank for safekeeping. Okay, we don't really need all this, but with what is more important is the right over real property. And these are mortgages and land charges. What are the difference? Um, any idea? Maybe you know this. What is the difference between a mortgage and a land charge under German law? Unterschied zwischen einer Hypothek und einer sogenannten Grundschuld. What might be the difference? It's actually explained on this um, page here. Grundschuld bleibt doch ans Grundstück gebunden. What do you mean? You have the correct idea. A land charge does not go in value, can be requested if the loan is paid in full. Also, in Grundstück kaufen könnte ich eine Grundschuld mitkaufen, wenn sie nicht abbezahlt ist. Um, yeah, not quite. Um, it works like this. Um, the mortgage, die Hypothek im deutschen Recht. Um, mortgage is bound um, and relates to the loan. So if you've repaid the loan, the mortgage disappears, it's invalid. The land charge, the Grundschuld, uh, continues to exist. However, you have repaid the Grundschuld, you have repaid the land charge, the loan, and you can then actually use the same land charge for a different loan if you need an additional loan for doing something else. And in, I would say, 99% of all those uh, mortgage loans and mortgage contracts um, in Germany, it's actually always a land charge that is uh, uh, agreed upon. Why? Um, because you have to pay a fee to a notary. notary. You have some transaction costs because this is entered in the official uh, land records. Um, and uh, it makes sense uh, to use a land charge in contrast to a mortgage because actually the land charge uh, can be used for different uh, housing uh, transactions and maybe a second loan. So this is why um, usually you, if you buy a flat or an apartment or a house, it's usually a land charge that you will be or the bank will be using. It's relativ einfach im, Deutsch, im deutschen Recht. Die Hypothek die ist eben an den Kreditvertrag die Grundschuld an das Grundstück gebunden. Um, und wenn Sie eine solche Grundschuld eintragen lassen, uh, den Kredit aber abgetragen haben, dann uh, stellt Ihnen die Bank uh, eine Bescheidigung aus, dass Sie diese eine Löschungsbewilligung, so nennt sich das, sodass die Bank dann um, bereit ist, dass diese Grundschuld im Grundbuch gelöscht wird. Das müssen Sie aber natürlich nicht tun, weil Sie haben ja dann ein Grundstück erworben, das letztlich mit einer Grundschuld versehen ist, dass die abbezahlt ist. Und Sie können dann mit dieser Grundschuld äh, zu jeder anderen Bank gehen und sagen, ja, ich habe doch hier eine Grundschuld drauf und ich bleibe eventuell sogar bei der gleichen Bank. Dann kann diese gleiche Grundschuld wieder belastet werden und Sie können einen zweiten Kredit aufnehmen äh, und haben keine Notarkosten. Damit können Sie also nur, insbesondere Notarkosten und Eintragungsgebühren beim uh, Amtsgericht dann sparen. Das ist also der Vorteil hier. Okay, and then last but not least, in addition to the collaterals, we also have additional agreements, most notably covenants. Uh, covenants are contractual agreements between the bank and the borrower um, 
to do something or to not do something uh, during the time uh, and the lifetime of uh, the loan agreement. So with affirmative covenants, the creditor agrees to perform or refrain from performing certain actions. And if those covenants, if those uh, agreements are not upheld, the bank has the right to terminate the contract before expiry. The financial covenants or the event risk covenants, they set financial key figures in case if you exceed them or if you fall below those uh, financial ratios, they allow the creditor to renegotiate or terminate prematurely. Or it uh, could also be the case that the bank is allowed, um, it's actually always the bank, in this case the creditor, uh, it allows the bank to um, reset, for example, the interest payment or to terminate. So they can increase the probability of loan repayment as the bank can check the debtor at an early stage. And in addition, they can limit the dangers which can result from incomplete financial contracts and because of moral hazards. So this is um, can be nice for the bank. What could be some affirmative covenants. The negative pledge prevents the collateralization of future debts to the disadvantage of the creditor. This is often connected with a positive declaration. For example, the property owner agrees to not encumber his or her property otherwise or sell it. We have the statement of equal treatment, Gleichbehandlungserklärung pari passu. This ensures that in case of bankruptcy, the bank claims have at least the same priority as the claims of other creditors. We have the cross default clause, which allows the creditor to terminate the credit when the economic situation of a company that has a cross guarantee system together with the debtor is impaired. And next, the owner maintenance clause. It allows the creditor to interfere at a change of ownership of the company, taking out the loan. Through the disposal of assets clause, the creditor, the bank can prevent or control the sale of assets. You don't want uh, your borrower to uh, sell off some assets. Dividend restriction clause is quite clear. It prohibits dividend payments or too high dividend payments. And the investment activities of a bank can also be limited or you can require some minimum investment activities by the company. Some examples for key figures in financial covenants. A minimum equity ratio, a certain return on investment, a certain cash flow. Quite simple. You want your company to be well um, 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 how do you say that? Capitally well capitalized, yes. Um, you want uh, to see a certain amount of money uh, invested and a certain return on your investment. And obviously, you want to see some cash flows and high enough liquidity so that the company is able uh, to pay, repay its loans. What types of loans do we have then? Usually we can distinguish between retail customers and corporate or sovereign clients. Uh, we then have short term, up to one year, medium and long term credit uh, and loan investments. And those are operating loans, bridging loans, discount credit, Lombard loan, credit, uh, guarantee credit, acceptance credit, overdraft line of credit, securities loan or a credit card credit. Consumer credit, real Darlehen, there's no good translation for that. Building society loan and investment loan, real credit, euro credit, promissory note loan, communal credit, or just communal loan. Let's go through these uh, in just a bit. Those operating loans are used for financing raw materials, consumables and supplies. If as a company you are in need of those um, loans to finance uh, the purchase of, say, raw materials to produce products. So usually they are repaid by the generated revenues of your production uh, and customer receivables, or if you sign over uh, warehouse stock, uh, might be that you need an, in an intermediate loan or bridging loan. It serves to overcome short-term liquidity shortages, hopefully triggered by a large order maybe something adverse like an uninsured fire damage but hopefully this is because you have so much new business coming in you need to buy some new machines and this would be considered an intermediate loan and could also be a discount loan a discount credit in which case companies offer customers uh, to exchange their claims against other parties for discount credits now um, with a Lombard loan um, a fixed credit amount is provided in sum and secured by pledging movable assets and rights. 
And in practice, you have overdrafts that are granted to which marketable securities serve as collateral. So you have securities um, that can be traded on the exchange. They are used as collateral. Um, and this is done in contrast to simply selling them off for um, um, or at a lower price. So in contrast to simply selling securities, you can use them as a collateral in a Lombard loan. Then the effect in Lombard credit, the loans collateralized on securities is a modified version of this real Lombard loan. And it has an advantage of fast and cost effective use of securities and the disadvantage that securities are subject to fluctuations in value that can reduce the collateral sum. Obviously, if you're using securities as a collateral in such a Lombard loan, the problem is that if the securities become worthless, your collateral sum re is reduced. And at some point, the bank might say, well, the collateral is now worthless. Uh, we have to change uh, the agreement uh, on your loan. Well, then I have the guarantee credit, the guarantee loans. The bank takes over either a surety or guarantee for the obligations of the customer against commission. Thus, we have an increase in credit that is facilitated for the guarantee borrower with a third party or his or her credibility is increased with business partners. Credit worthiness, actually. Credibility is a rather strange translation here. We have accept credite, acceptance credits. In this case, the bank accepts a bill drawn from the customer on the bank for which payment it bears liability against commission. The beneficiary of the bill is the customer's creditor, for example, a supplier of goods which are to be sold. Now, I don't want to go through the remaining types of loans. As you can see, especially for the corporate and sovereign clients, it's quite clear. Investment loans are mid to long term uh, loans used for financing investments. Real credits are used to finance building projects and real estate uh, loans. Euro credits are um, credits uh, and loans, credits, not really loans, uh, that total several millions of so extremely large ones. Uh, we also have promissory note loans. They were often granted against issuing a promissory note worth uh, maybe one up to 100 million. And we have municipal loans that are given to municipalities. Also self-explanatory. Factoring, leasing are two types of loans, actually. Uh, factoring is the ongoing purchase of trade receivables by specialized credit institutions. So the factor takes over certain services such as uh, accounting, collection, dunning, and the buyer bears the default risk for a fee. Leasing is the process of renting goods from financial institutions or from the manufacturers of goods directly, that is direct leasing, and the lesser accounts for the maintenance costs of the leased asset. And you can see this many, many times for uh, Xerox machines, photocopy machines, because these are owned by uh, the manufacturers and they are rented out to, say, universities, companies, etc. Now, for retail customers, we have current accounts, overdraft facilities, uh, securities lending, credit card loans, etc. I think this is self-explanatory. We don't need to go into this. Consumer or installment loans, they are used to finance larger consumer wishes, up to 25,000 euros. Real estate loans, quite clear, usually a land charge that is used, and Grundschuld. And building savings loans, Bauspar-Kredite. They are granted within the framework of a building loan agreement and a building society, and they may only be used for housing related activities. Okay. Last but not least, we have loan securitization. Uh, loan securitization is the process of taking a loan or taking a portfolio of loans and putting it, melting it into a security that can be sold or bought by investors. So a bank knows more about the credit worthiness of its debtors than other potential investors. Thus, it is many times very difficult to simply sign over loans. Ja, also es ist schwer, die abzutreten, weil Sie als Bank wissen ja einfach mehr über Ihre Kreditnehmer als irgendein potenzieller Investor. But if the bank wants to sell part of its credit risk portfolio, potential buyers might fear that the bank is selling only the bad risks. So the borrower's credit worthiness would have to be checked again. That's a problem. Now with a classic loan sale, 
all or some parts of a cash flow of one or several loans are sold. So all rights and obligations of the lender under the loan agreement are transferred to the buyer. And the borrower's consent is usually not required for this. So if I have a loan against uh, one of you, someone else, if I sell it uh, off to someone else, you don't have to, you don't need to be, um, uh, I don't need your consent and you don't need to be notified. Now, loan securitization is a very pleasant way and very neat way of transferring these loans and making it marketable uh, to investors. Um, let's skip uh, this historical uh, idea. Let's simply go to the basic idea of what is done here. Now, with grant alone, um, and granting alone often requires collateral. Now, the borrower requires liquidity in this case, but cannot or does not want to sell the assets. So in case of factoring, we've seen the assets are actually sold. Uh, we don't want to um, sell those loans individually uh, via a classic loan sale because the asymmetric information is problematic in this case. Um, we've seen mortgage banks refinance their lending business usually with collateralized bonds with fund brief. Now what you can do instead is you can use asset-backed securities or ABS constructions. They combine features of financial transactions, of a loan sale, of a fund brief. So what happens is we securitize those loans or the portfolio of loans. And let's look at this structure. It looks rather complicated, but actually it's quite simple. We are a bank. Uh, we are the originator. We do have a portfolio of loans. Well, this is the first step. We form, we found a special purpose vehicle, an SPV, which is basically a, a mailbox company, a shell company uh, that is located in a tax haven uh, state, like the Cayman Islands, uh, Guernsey or Jersey, um, or the Bahamas. And we are selling off those assets, the loans, to the special purpose vehicle. This is a company. The special purpose vehicle then by using, for example, a consortium of banks, maybe or maybe not, they will be issuing bonds. Usually they will issue bonds and the uh, balance sheet of the SPV will look like this. As assets, they have the loans. Let's use this function here. They will have the loans and they will issue on their, sorry, on their liability side, they will issue bonds. Now the bonds can then be bought by investors. So if you see placement here, it means that bonds are placed and the purchase price is the price investors pay for the bonds in this special purpose vehicle. So you take a number of loans, the loans are the only assets of this special purpose vehicle and investors can then buy bonds or also stocks of this special purpose vehicle but as the special purpose vehicle only keeps this portfolio on its asset side of the balance sheet, every debt or equity investor in the special purpose vehicle invests in this particular portfolio of loans. Then we have a rating agency. The rating agency will look at the special purpose vehicle and say, well, uh, they only have this portfolio of loans, so we are giving it a triple A rating. Those are excellent loans. Uh, this special purpose vehicle has high enough collaterals and this is a triple A rated company. It could also be that actually the special purpose vehicle issues different types of bonds and also equity. So it might be that we don't have bonds here, but we have bond A and say bonds, bonds B and bonds C and it has equity and you can now see that maybe for example you can say that who has to uh, bolster um, losses at first equity who gets money back first bonds in group A then bonds in group investors in bond B, then bonds in C. And last but not least, the last investors who will, will get their money back in case of default of the SPV, this is the equity. And then you will have the equity tranche. We have different tranches. 
unterschiedliche Tranchen. And these are then called the Senior Tranche, the Mezzanine Tranche or the Equity Tranche. Ja, also die Senior Tranche, die Mezzanine Tranche oder die Equity, die Eigenkapital Tranche. And as you can see here, you can invest in this bond, in this bond and this bond. And just based on this construction, you, do, you can see that actually this is a pretty good idea. This is quite good um, and a very clever way of liquidating those portfolios of loans via this asset-backed security transaction. You do have a servicer and a trustee. We don't really need this, but actually you can see here, those are the different tranches, maybe the different types of securities, senior, mezzanine, subordinated, or even the equity tranche. Okay, so that's an SPV and that's loan securitization. Uh, we do have some, some, uh, some more details on loan secu securitization, but I think you can read through those slides yourself. I would very much like you to understand this construction of an ABS transaction. It's a very clever way of liquidating uh, loans uh, and transferring loans from a bank to investors. Problem is that during the financial crisis, there was a lot going wrong um, with these transactions. First of all, the rating agencies did not, go to do, did not do a good job with rating these different SPVs and these different tranches. And the problem is, if you'd now take these two and a different SPV and then securitize these bonds again and then again, at the end, the investors are not aware of the risk they are actually buying into. They only see the interest rate, looks good, but they don't know how risky these investments are. And that's what basically what happened during the financial crisis. Okay, so that's loan securitization for you. Some legal restrictions as well. The advantages are, of course, that you as a bank, you receive liquidity. You are able to sell off your loans if you want to. And investors can then invest in loans um, even if they are not a bank. So you can buy a bond uh, via an ABS transaction. And the advantage is that you as an investor, for example, you could be a pension fund, you don't need to know anything about banking and how to work as a bank to invest in credit risk. And this is one huge advantage of ABS uh, transactions. Yeah? So some risks are here as well, but I think this is, uh, is not as important as uh, the general structure. Now, on this slide here, uh, you can see the general problems during the financial crisis. What happened is that US banks um, securitized especially subprime mortgage loans. Um, so they were highly risky. They were securitized, sold off to investors all around the world. And this is how the US housing crisis developed and evolved into a global financial crisis because banks all around the world and pension funds and insurance companies had bought into these loan portfolios that had been securitized by US banks based on US mortgage loan and subprime mortgage loan portfolios. Okay, I think that's enough. Um, now we have talk enough about commercial banking and I'm almost two minutes over time. So do you have any questions when it comes to commercial banking, deposit taking and the lending business side of banks? I don't see any questions in the chat window. So if you don't have any questions, Thank you very much for your attention. Have a nice evening and see you next week. Bye-bye.